Stanford University. Woody Kincaid carrying the deuce to the line. His official time, 728.24. Well, that's interesting. At the 2023 John Thomas Terrier Classic invite, several distance records and PRs were absolutely shattered, most notably Woody Kincaid's US 5K American record that is now number four on the all-time list. This time is seven seconds faster than his outdoor best and with World Athletics point conversions would be a 1237, with an asterisk, of course. This isn't the first time this happened though, or the second or the third. This track has produced a great deal of the best indoor track times ever, in a very short period of time. But why is this? Are there more tracks like this? Is it just placebo? Is it the competition? What about Caitlin Tui? She didn't race at Boston. Keely Hodgkinson didn't either. While records have been set at other tracks, Boston University's is simply on another level. And by the end of this video, you may come to the conclusion that the campus could very well be housing what people are now calling a super track. But where did this all start? The father of indoor track innovation to pretty much everyone is this guy, Floyd Highfill. While he had a couple appearances in the newspaper as a distance runner for the University of New Mexico, he also had a chemical engineering background where he developed a wide range of skills throughout the engineering world. Combining the two interests, Highfill and coach Hugh Hackett began their first project by implementing a track inside their campus's renowned Tingley Coliseum, with the expectation of having it finished by January 1964. Surely enough, the one 170 yard or 161 meter track was finished and ready to go. But little did Highfield know that this would only be the beginning of his journey as an indoor track connoisseur. The article notes that this track had turns that rose and sloped back downwards. This is what we now know as a banked track. The concept of these mainly arose because of how difficult it is to turn on a track half the size. But there would be something unique about Highfield's particular rendition of them. Like most banked indoor tracks you know, they use what's called a symmetric banking system, where you reach the peak of the track in the middle of the bank and the slopes up and down are identical. Highfield's design, on the other hand, is asymmetric, where the turns quickly rise to their peak and slowly seep back down until the next straightaway. He argued that a symmetrical track forced the runner to alter their stride for too long on turns, disrupting the flow of a fast athlete that should be able to maintain their form for the entire race. These tracks also used plywood, which he speculated to be the perfect surface to make these on. And why that is is something we'll look into shortly. Over time, Highfield operated under the company Tracks West and built a slew of indoor tracks to be utilized by indoor facilities that would be the hot spots to break records. So much so that Highfield's tracks were credited with over 100 world records by 1982. As time went on though, and with Highfield's eventual retirement, very few of these Highfield styled tracks exist, as nearly all banked indoor tracks nowadays are crafted by Mondo. One pure Highfield track still remains though, and that's no other than Boston University's. Still uses plywood, has a massive asymmetrical bank of 18 0.5 degrees, and ever since pros started racing there more consistently, it has seen an incredible volume of records and fast times there now. Boston isn't the only place that holds world records though, of course, as other tracks have had their fair share too. Does this mean Highfield's efforts were just the result of the natural progression of athletes getting better, or is there actually a certain magic to be explained here? As noted before, Highfield tracks specifically used plywood. Early on, he suspected to provide the right amount of bounce, which means the amount of energy return you'll get from it will increase as well. Think of it like the PIBA foam that Nike Super Shoes utilize. They rely on the notion of resilience or elasticity to provide the runner maximum energy return to run at high intensities for longer periods of time. One of the most convincing studies of Highfield's plywood claim was supported quite well by a study conducted in 1979 by Thomas McMahon. Eventually, they found a sweet spot where the surface provided just enough compliance with the runner that they could reap the benefits of running on a very soft surface without having to sacrifice their form. This is represented by their experimental plywood boards that they found to have a sizable improvement in performance, something that would go on to be used at Harvard's indoor track. Now this study does have some flaws, the biggest one being that it only concerned a person's sprinting speed, but McMahon would publish another study on this particular phenomenon shortly before his passing. This study had sub 
objects run at a much more moderate pace for a longer period of time, and instead used an adjustable treadmill that emulated varying degrees of stiffness. As the surface got more compliant, they found that runners were using much less energy and their running form had stayed virtually unaffected as well. Harvard's track during this era had a stiffness of around 195 kilonewtons per meter, whereas modern tracks that use synthetic surfaces supported by something like steel or asphalt are much, much less resilient in comparison. As mentioned before, the bank of an indoor track is extremely important for runners to efficiently go around turns, but there's a lot more to it than that. Whenever you go around a turn on a track at a certain velocity, it requires another force, the centripetal force to be exact. Basically, the faster you go, the more of this force you need to generate. However, on a tight 200 meter track, you would need to generate about double the amount of centripetal force compared to a 400 meter one, since the radius of the turns is nearly halved. If we bank the track, especially if we have the option to choose the bank angle, something magical happens. Without getting too complicated, for every bank angle on a track, there's an optimal speed you can run at to where you don't have to generate any extra friction. Dr. Burns provides us with a graph that illustrates this notion quite nicely. At a track like Michigan's, the Armory, and many other banked tracks, the optimal speed is 36.3 seconds every lap. BU, on the other hand, drastically increases to a speed of 26.8 seconds every lap. Take Kajelcha's mile record for example. He's running fairly close to the optimal speed to get the benefits of the bank, but still shy enough to where he is still using some outwards friction to maintain his form. With these data points in mind, let's head over to the all-time list to see if there's any striking correlations. Out of the top 100 men's indoor 5,000 meter times, 57 of them have been set at Boston University, and a great majority of these are from the last few years alone. On the women's side, it's 62, which is a tad surprising given the average pace would likely fit a track like the Armories, but it can also be a testament to just how beneficial running on a plywood surface is given the energy return. A decent amount of these times as well are also lifetime bests between indoor and outdoor, which is incredibly odd given these times were not only done at a base building part of their year, but on an indoor 200 meter track nevertheless. As for the men's mile, a healthy amount of the top times have been done on high filled tracks, especially BU in recent years, but on the women's side, it seems to be more centralized around the armory with some old school records lingering around, which makes sense on a mechanical level, but also likely because the armory hosts consistently competitive meets too. As for the 3K on either side, BU doesn't dominate anywhere near as much as the 5K, but it should be worth noting that results from this venue do come from a track that is made of plywood. Information on other tracks that host amazing times is scarce at best, but it is possible that some of these athletes are so beyond talented that they're capable of breaking records without the use of a high fill track. Perhaps the most damning evidence surrounding all of this is the notion of athletes beating their outdoor times at an indoor facility, because on paper, it should be improbable at best. But BU seems to be the main culprit that counteracts this on an astounding level at times. There's a few factors that can play into the rapid improvement of distance indoor track times as well, as some will argue that these outweigh the notion of BU being a super track. Starting off with the obvious, the rise of super shoes. Super shoes have proven to increase running economy by around 3% on average, so it's no surprise that athletes are improving by virtue of new equipment alone. Indoor races could also be becoming more and more competitive on average, as elites become more invested in these high-octane, record-chasing endeavors, along with new training revelations that can influence this as well. Lastly, some have argued a potential placebo effect on runners where if they know a track is fast preemptively, then they will go into the stadium with the preconceived notion that they will run well. Outside of super shoes though, these arguments lend themselves to be a bit superficial. The very likely reality is that high fills track design combined with a high bank angle relative to nearly every other existing indoor track just makes Boston University objectively the best track to run at between the mile and 5k, as the overwhelming amount of top times being set there cannot be ignored. To say that fast times here are being created via more competition and placebo alone is simply outclassed by the raw amount of information we know about how indoor tracks work. Of course, there is always more research to be done, but what we have right now is likely sufficient to make a sound conclusion. As a final sound bite, this video is not to claim a super track is necessary for an indoor world or national record, as there are plenty of records that have been set on non-optimal tracks. However, 
If every elite athlete were to run at BU in peak shape, under a perfectly controlled environment like world-class indoor meets are, would we see world records of many types just shatter? This prediction is a bit dramatic and perhaps reactionary, but also not a far reality given the precedents that have been set. The stringent nature of indoor track seasons make it so we may never see the true potential of how fast people can truly race at BU. But what we have right now is certainly eye-opening and honestly fun to watch moving forward. Even if indoor isn't perceived as important as outdoor, the concept of fast tracks isn't even centralized within just indoor facilities. But that's for another time. If you want to know more about this, please check out Dr. Jeffrey Burns' pieces on these. His write-ups on this are fantastic, and I will link some other studies I used as well. As always, I'll see you all in whatever video I upload next, and take care.